go. All right, good. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, so Kenneth asked me if I could uh, present. Uh, it's a slightly modified version from a talk I gave at the uh, PERT. Uh, so practice, practice and experience in advanced research computing. Uh, next seat conference in the US. I presented that in uh, August, I believe, or July, was it? Uh, so it's about uh, how Compute Canada a couple of years ago uh, started uh, working to provide a unified user environment for all of the uh, clusters in Canada. Uh, so I'm uh, the team lead for uh, for the research support national team, uh, but this is not work done by, by me. Uh, it's done in uh, large part by Bart Oldeman, who is uh, now easy build maintainer as well. Uh, Ryan Taylor also is the team lead for one of the infrastructure that, that we use, and a lot of other uh, HPC analysts uh, in Canada. So it's really a big uh, collaborative uh, effort. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, the presentation outline, so I'll first uh, talk a little bit about Compute Canada, what, uh, what we are, where we were, and uh, where, where we're heading. Um, then uh, I'll give a broad overview of the way we install software, the goals that we had, and why we made some design choices. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the tools that are used. Uh, obviously, you know Easy Build, but some of you might not know CDMFS or Nix. Uh, probably, I think everyone uh, knows Elmod in uh, this community. Uh, a few words about Python and uh, Anaconda because we, we have a, a pretty, uh, pretty unique solution. I don't think anyone else is doing what, what we are doing for, for those packages. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about monitoring. I'll try to do a, a demo if uh, time allows, uh, and then summarize uh, at the end. Um, I don't know, do you want to take questions during the talk or, or after the talk? Uh, how do you want it to be, uh, to be set up? After is probably better for us, I think. All right. Uh, so what is Compute Canada? Uh, so it's really a consortium of institutions within, uh, within Canada. Uh, or actually, it's, it's a con consortium of consortia, so there are four regional ones. Uh, so in Canada, 10 provinces, uh, so there is West Grid, which, uh, which is a consortia in the provinces in the West. Uh, there's Compute Ontario, Ontario is big enough to be its own, uh, its own consortia. Uh, uh, same thing with uh, Calco Quebec. So Quebec, is, so Ontario and Quebec are the two most uh, populous provinces in Canada. And then there is ASNET uh, in the Atlantic provinces. So it's uh, 35, or maybe the number has grown or reduced in, uh, since I made the, the since I got the statistics. But roughly 35 institutions. So those are universities. Uh, those could be research centers, but all of them are funded. To do academic research, so that's the that's the clientele that we that we uh, serve. Uh, so we uh, we have uh, roughly 200 technical staff, uh, 15,000 user accounts, and as probably is the same everywhere. That count grows every year. It's free access for any researcher at the Canadian uh, teaching institution, uh, and uh, we have people from, from all disciplines. I guess uh, I'll just reduce that. Uh, so, of course, uh, biology, life sciences, physics, engineering, chemistry are the big ones. But more and more, we are seeing uh, people from social sciences or from uh, humanities or business that start using uh, our services. So those that, that we call uh, non-traditional uh, users. Uh, so before 2015, so that, that was a big transition year in, in Compute Canada, there were around 30 different sites, 30 different clusters, uh, actually 50 different clusters, uh, and they were all managed separately. So there was a team of uh, one, two or three people in each site uh, managing the cluster, reinstalling the software. Um, and uh, in so at, at the time, uh, it was really the installations were done locally, uh, maybe documented, maybe not, uh, usually not automated, not standardized. So users 
users technically could access any of those 50 clusters, uh, but in practice they did not because each one of them had different module structure, different uh, scheduler, different file system organization. So it, it was all uh, all different. So it, it was uh, difficult for users to move from one to, to another cluster. Um, in uh, 2015, uh, there was new funding from the government to deploy larger clusters uh, and a consolidation of the site hosting, uh, hosting equipment. So we went from 30 uh, to, to five sites uh, in, the, in 2015 and the years that followed. And uh, there was really a shift in focus toward uh, unifying the user experience. Uh, so in terms of hardware, where we are at now, uh, we have five major clusters. One, one is a cloud. Uh, we have three, uh, what we call general purpose clusters. So those are clusters that have uh, some large memory nodes, some GPU nodes, uh, not necessarily uh, very fast interconnect across the whole cluster. Um, so really general purpose. And uh, we have one uh, large MPI cluster, uh, which is really optimized for large parallel tasks. So, uh, uh, it, it has a dragonfly infinite <coughs> fabric. Um, so th those are the, the types of infrastructures that we have. Um, we also, there are still some variation in the hardware on the cluster. So for example, one of them uses Intel on the back, whereas uh, the others use uh, Infiniban. Uh, the generations of CPUs can be different. So we have Haswell and Skylake. Uh, gen generation of GPUs as well. We have uh, Pascal and we have Volta. Um, and we also have some legacy uh, systems uh, that are still online, uh, although not uh, part of the main, the, the main focus of, of this work here. Uh, so part of the, the transition, there were some national teams that were created. Uh, there, there are national teams for all the, the uh, main aspects of, uh, of operating a, a cluster data center. Uh, the main two one that are, um, that are uh, relevant for this talk is the research support national team, which I lead, and the CDMFS national team, which manages the CDMFS infrastructure. So the research support national team, our mandates are uh, managing the help desk, uh, the documentation, and the software installation mostly for the, uh, the post-2015 systems, although uh, from the start we did design things so that they could work on legacy systems so that uh, our work would be reused. And uh, all, of, all of the future national services as well. Uh, so it's really a national effort. So I talked a little bit about the different regions in, uh, in uh, Canada, we have members of all of the different regions <coughs> and many of the different institutions that are on the team. Um, so, and, and for software installation in particular, uh, there are the people that are on the team which do uh, mostly the, the groundwork and the coordination, but we have over uh, 45 uh, other staff that, are, that have permission to publish software and have, have access, have, have the, the training. Uh, to install software, uh, so it, it really does not rely on one single person. Um, the software environment, so the, the goal we set uh, back in 2015 is that users should be presented with an interface that is uh, consistent across clusters, uh, easy to use, um, and, uh, and uh, across all sites. And of course, we're, we're doing HPC, so we want it to uh, offer optimal, quote unquote, optimal performance. Um, so that, that meant all software needs to be accessible on every site reliably uh, and, and performantly. Uh, because the sites are still managed by different systems teams, uh, it should be independent from the OS. Basically, we cannot rely that all of the clusters will evolve at the same pace. Uh, one cluster could move to CentOS 8 before the other clusters. So we don't have to have, we don't want to have a dependency on the, uh, the operating system. We, we do have some clusters that have a very minimal uh, operating system with, without, with basically any, without basically any package that you would install on CentOS. 
uh, and we have other clusters that are uh, basically full feature, uh, so they, they have a lot of human packages installed. But we want to make sure that the software stack is independent of that as much as we can. Uh, of course, we want, since, since it's a big collaborative effort, we want installations to be tracked and reproducible uh, via tools like EasyBuild. And uh, because we are serving a, a very large community of users, we knew from the start we would, we would have a <coughs> number of software installed. Uh, so we, we want to design the module interface so that it, it can handle a very large software stack without overloading the user uh, with information. So with those goals, uh, we, uh, we evaluated different, different tools uh, and, uh, and selected a, a few of them. So CVMFS uh, was selected as a, a distribution mechanism. So that's how uh, we ensure that the install software actually make it to the site. Uh, for consistency, for the part to make it independent from the OS, uh, we chose Nix. Uh, although, uh, as I will say uh, later, the, this will be changing. Um, for the scientific software, we chose EasyBuild. So we look at SPAC, EasyBuild. Um, I think there was another one, but I don't recall which one. Uh, and so we went uh, with EasyBuild and uh, mod, uh, LMOD because we really wanted to have a hierarchical uh, module tree to avoid presenting users with 5,000 different modules. Uh, so it, it allows us to, to make it uh, a little bit more specific to, uh, to the, the cluster or the compiler that is loaded. So we, we really wanted a, a hierarchical uh, module tree. So a few words about each of the tools. So CVMFS stands for Stern Virtual Machine File System. Uh, it, it is an, infra, an infrastructure in, in and of, of itself. Uh, so there is a national team that manages the infrastructure. My team is really a client of that team. So we don't, we don't manage all of the infrastructure that is behind it, uh, but there, there is a team uh, in charge of that. Um, and it's really, uh, it's really a system to distribute content. Um, so it's a distributed file system. It was meant to uh, geo-replicate uh, files across the, the whole world in, in the case of, of CERN. Uh, the clients will mount a file system. Uh, so it's a POSIX file system. It's mounted with uh, Fuse and uh, the content is distributed over HTTP. It offers uh, transparent deduplication, uh, chunking and compression. So if you have the same file, for example, the same header file, uh, it will just store one copy of it, and it will uh, it, so so that that will save space. Um, it, the way the clients uh, access the file is they pull uh, the file on demand. So that means if a cluster is in an outage, we can still install software, and whenever it comes back, the clients can uh, get those files. Uh, because that can add latency, there is uh, aggressive caching, so there's multiple layers of caching to, uh, to reduce the latency. So basically it can be a little bit slow the very first time you access the file, but after that it's like it's a, a local file system. Uh, it's designed to be highly reliable, so there are redundant start servers, transparent uh, failover, so there's no single point of failure uh, at all in the system. And uh, it's um, it, it provides atomic updates, so either the client will see the new software or will not see it, but it will not. When, when you publish a transaction, the, the client will see the full transaction. Uh, so you, you won't have part of a software that is, uh, that is distributed all on any kind. Uh, so schemat schematically, the way it looks like, uh, we have a data entry point, which is where we compile the software. This is injected in a, on a server that's called the, the Stratum Zero. It's, it's designed a little bit like uh, uh, the time servers. So there's a Stratum Zero, which is the, the reference. This gets uh, replicated fully uh, on multiple Stratum 1s. And all of the clients never access the Stratum Zero. So if that one is down for a period of time, the only impact is that for that period of time, we cannot deploy new software, but uh, it does not uh, does not prevent any of the clients to work. So it's not a failure on the client side. 
Um, we currently have, I think, four or five uh, Strata ones uh, that are all hosted within Compute Canada. Uh, I think the CBMFS team is looking to host uh, to to host some of them on uh, on the public cloud as well to make it even more uh, reliable uh, uh, internationally. So this is managed by the central team. Uh, this uh, on, on the right side is managed by each of the, the cluster. So typically you will have uh, multiple caching proxies. So those are HTTP proxy uh, that will, so, uh, they will contact the strand one and they will keep the files uh, local to the cluster. So any files that, is, that has been accessed on the cluster will still be uh, available even if you have uh, an outage of your wide area network in the cluster. Uh, so there is that local cache on the split proxies. And each of the client nodes also have, uh, usually uh, if there are the local disks on the client node, uh, the recommendation is to have a local cache on the local disk. So once the file has been read, it, it really acts as a local file system. So you don't have latency uh, from your parallel file system, for example. Um, if the client nodes, if the compute nodes don't have a local disk, it's possible to have a cache on the parallel file system, uh, but that's not the, the recommended way uh, if you have uh, uh, other choices. Uh, so that's the distribution mechanism. The way we design the software stack, so we, we have a, a kind of a layered approach. So the, the first layer at the bottom, the red one, it, this is really what's managed. This is the only thing that is managed by the cluster team. So it's the operating system kernel, the daemons, the drivers, anything that is privileged, we don't distribute that. This is completely in their yard. Um, some legally restricted <coughs> software, to, uh, for example, VASP or Gaussian, those are installed just locally. Uh, there's a little bit of a gray, gray area. So to compile things like OpenMPI, you need to have the InfiniBand uh, libraries, for example or the Solarum library. So we have a version that is available uh, on the software stack and we build against that, but it can be over uh, overridden locally with, uh, with path or the library path or the, this kind of mechanism. Then the next layer, it provides everything down to the libc. Uh, so the auto tool, the, the, the bin utils, Everything uh, that you would typically install with uh, with Yum uh, on CentOS will be installed in the next layer. And then on top of that, uh, the, the green one we almost no longer do because we ran into problems with the, with the next layer. Um, but it's something that we could do uh, <coughs> so to install through next, but wrap it as a module uh, installed with easy build. Uh, but we tried that. Sometimes it works, but we do run into issues, so we tend to not use that uh, if we can. Uh, and finally, on top of it, the easy build layer. Uh, this is where things like uh, uh, compilers, OpenMPI, the, the Chrome Max application, all that, that kind of thing will be installed. And it has multiple, we, we build for multiple different architect, CPU architecture. For, so we support down to SSE 3. Uh, and up to AVX 512. Uh, I probably don't need to spend much time on uh, what what EasyBuild or Nix is. So you you I guess the crowd here uh, all know uh, building through recipes. Nix or EasyBuild is basically the, the same thing. You have a recipe, and that's how the software is built and installed. It, it uses different language, but uh, it's, it's basically the same concept. Um, so Nix is really um, a package manager that is really designed for an operating system. Uh, so there, there is Nix, uh, but there's also Nix OS, uh, which you could install down to the kernel with. And it's really built around repro reproducibility. So everything you install is installed in the directory that contains a hash of the recipe. So if you change something in the recipe, it will create a, a new installation. And that's uh, that's really nice for reproducibility, but that's actually what caused this problem. Uh, because at some point, you need to do garbage collection because you, you get too many different installations. And um, as long as things 
are installed within Linux, it's fine because it will not garbage collect the dependencies, but as soon as you start building things on top of it, uh, like with easy build or like a user uh, installing something by their own, well, Nix does no longer tracks those dependency, and if you do garbage collection, you will break things. So this is uh, part of the reason we are looking uh, to move away from Nix in the future. Um, easy build, again, I probably can skip those slides. Um, yeah, we'll just skip them. Uh, well, well, this slide. So our, uh, the, the way we process software installation requests um, first, we typically install only upon request, uh, so we have too many softwares to just uh, uh, systemic, systematically go and install new versions. We do it when the user requests it. Um, we have a build node, so we build the software with easy build on a specific VM. Uh, we can test it on the build node. If it's not okay, it's not even deployed to CVMFS. Uh, if it's okay, we have two different uh, CVMFS infrastructure, uh, the development one and the production one. So we can publish on the, the development CVMFS infrastructure. This is accessible in the cluster, but not visible to the users uh, by default. So this allows us to test on the cluster if, they, if there's a need to. Uh, for example, if we need a GPU and our build node doesn't have a GPU, well, we, we can test that at that stage. Uh, if everything is fine, then we we can publish to the uh, the production uh, uh, CDMFS repository, and then it becomes uh, visible on, on all of the clusters um, within within half an hour. It's visible it visi visible all across Canada or all, all across the, the world if, if there are clusters, if there are clients who mount our CDMFS elsewhere. Um, the General uh, overview of how many software we, we have currently. Uh, I, actually, that, that slide is outdated. We don't have 4,000. We are now uh, above 5,000 different permutation of, uh, of installation. So that includes permutation of the compiler, of the um, CPU architecture, and of, of software version. Um, so this is roughly the, the curve uh, of how many packages we've had over time. Uh, and we, we can see the, the importance of using a uh, tool like Easy Build uh, right here. So back last fall, we deployed our first cluster that was using Skylake CPUs. And we basically recompiled the whole stack in a matter of days uh, because it was all automated with, uh, with Easy Build. So we were basically limited by the, the CPU power of, of our build node. Uh, that, that was the limitation. So 95% of their software we compiled fine and we had to tweak a little bit uh, a handful of software. Um, the same thing, so I, I will talk a little bit later about uh, how we deal with Python. It's also, we also have uh, recipes, which, which are much simpler, uh, but we, we also can recompile Python packages um, quite, uh, quite quickly. So this is the, the key that, that we had for Python 3.8, for example, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this is actually the storage space used on the stratum zero. So you, you can see, and, and the, the time scales are, are not exactly the same, but you can see here we almost, uh, we increase the number of software private packages by like 50%. And because of the duplication, because of, of chunking, so the optimizations that are on the CVMFS infrastructure, the actual storage use increased just by a little bit. Uh, so that's all of the header files and the, the data sets that could be provided with the software. Those were not were deduplicated, so only one copy was kept. Uh, so this, this is, uh, in, in practice, we have, uh, I think it's over three terabytes of software installed on our build node. But once compression and the duplication kicks in, we only have 600 gigabytes. <coughs> of space used on the CDMFS infrastructure. Uh, we also support licensed packages, uh, which are, of course, not distributed publicly. Um, so uh, I said we had two CDMFS uh, infrastructure. We, uh, we actually have three because we have one which is restricted uh, to, to only Compute Canada clusters. 
so we have uh, partnerships with different vendors. Uh, so we ask them for the authorization to, to install it on, on our cluster. So we have different solutions for, for uh, most of the, the commercial packages. Uh, so the user interface, uh, well, because we have so many modules, we really want to have a hierarchy. Uh, so we use LMOD. Uh, we have things that are installed at, at a core level. So those are not optimized for the CPU architecture. They are built for SSC3, or maybe not even SSC3. Those are things like, uh, like compiler, like, well, commercial packages are often not, uh, not, not optimized for CPU architecture, so that, that kind of thing. Um, then uh, we have a, a branch of the hierarchy for each uh, different CPU architecture. And under that, we have either uh, the compiler dependent, compiler and MPI dependent, compiler and CUDA, or the combination of all three. So compiler, CUDA, and MPI dependent. Those are different branches. Of, uh, of the hierarchy. And uh, so if, if you've ever used the hierarchical module uh, structure, that means users only see by default the modules that were built with the compiler or MPI uh, version that, that are loaded currently. Um, a little bit about Python and, and Anaconda as well. I don't know if there are uh, a lot of, uh, of fans of Anaconda in the room, if uh, you are, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so Anaconda, I think, was started uh, because Python was bad at packaging, uh, which has improved uh, a lot over time. Uh, but what we really don't like, and we uh, explicitly recommend against using Anaconda in our environment, uh, what we really don't like is can do things like that. So. Conda install GCC or OpenMPI or CUDA toolkit, which are really things that users should never install. It should be installed by uh, somebody who knows what they're doing, and it should be installed to uh, to bind correctly with the with the hardware, which Conda will, will not do. Uh, and it's also duplicating a lot of software. It's putting stress on the parallel file system because every user reinstalls that, uh, and so yeah, we really don't like. Anaconda. Um, the alternative that we use, um, and so I know EasyBuild, uh, a lot of people install Python packages as a module. Uh, we took a different approach because there are just too many Python packages with their own dependency resolution, and we do not want to reproduce that in a module. So uh, what we use instead, uh, we, we use Python wheels. So wheels are really binary packages uh, similar to what you would install with Yum for operating system packages, but uh, meant for Python. And you can actually compile your own wheel uh, links uh, linked against your own uh, libraries. So this is what we do. Um, so we currently have uh, 3,000 uh, different wheels. We have things like TensorFlow for CPU or GPU, uh, H5Pi that is linked against uh, our uh, version of HDF5. Um, NumPy, the wheel that we provide will be linked against MKL. So we, we take care of, uh, of building the Python package against our libraries, uh, but we still provide uh, them. U users still just do a pip install like they could do, uh, and it would download a wheel from the internet, uh, but instead it will uh, take it in, in our, uh, what, what we call a wheel house. So it will install our version of the uh, of the Python package uh, before uh, fetching from the internet. Uh, so this is actually a quote uh, that uh, that really is about the two the two snakes, but I think it applies quite well to uh, the, the the tools. Remember that anacondas are heavier and bulkier, while Python are longer and more uh, more agile. Um, so this is my pitch uh, against Anaconda and for Python wheel instead. Um, we do, so within our stack, we want to be able to see uh, which modules are, are used by user uh, so that we can potentially deprecate some versions. Uh, so for example, Python uh, 2.7, we want to know 
uh, how, how much longer is that going to be used so that potentially in the future we can give users a warning, tell them you should really be moving to Python 3. Um, we probably won't ever remove it unless we find a, a security reason, uh, but still we want to drive users to use more, more recent versions. Uh, so every time a user issues a module load command, we, we have hooks in, uh, in LMOD that will basically send a line to syslog and uh, all of the syslog for Compute Canada clusters are aggregated into an ELK, an Elasticsearch uh, instance. Uh, and we have Grafana that can be used to produce different dashboards for module usage, uh, so, such, a, such as this one. So we can identify which version of the module is used, who is using it, uh, and potentially contact the user. We have done that, for example, for uh, Singularity. Uh, there are uh, pretty frequently security uh, issues with Singularity, and we actually need to, dip, to remove old modules. Uh, so with that, we can track and uh, contact the users directly if they are using a, a version that will be retired. Um, for documentation, our, our stack automatically, when we publish uh, a new software, uh, it will be listed on our wiki. So we have a, a script that will look at the modules that are installed. And if, if there's something new, it will add it to, to our wiki. Uh, same thing for Python wheels. Uh, so if, if you if you go on that link, it lists, and the, the page is getting uh, bulkier uh, over time because we, we have so many, but we have um, here on the on, on our wiki the list of everything that is installed, potentially a link to the documentation page if there's some, uh, and users can choose between different CPU architecture because we, we might not have rebuilt everything. Uh, for uh, for different uh, architecture, even though we, we strive to, sometimes we we, we just miss something. Uh, back to the slide. Oh yeah, the demo. Um, and just before I do the demo, so when I presented at Perk, uh, I tweeted uh, that before Perk. So if I wanted to use uh, the HPC cluster stack on a Windows laptop. Uh, how how crazy would would you think that uh, that would be? And this uh, is actually something that is possible, uh, which I did demo at Perk, uh, but I will not now because I no longer have Windows installed on my uh, my MacBook. Uh, but it does work if you use Windows Subsystem for Linux, which is a little bit cheating because it, it's really a VM. But uh, if you do that, you install Ubuntu. I had. Uh, here, uh, that was a that was a screenshot that was on my Windows computer. I sourced, I installed CDMFS, and I could start Paraview, and that was running locally on my computer. It was not X11 for warning. Uh, it was not SSHFS. It was really running locally on, on my computer. And so, for the demo. Uh, we have documented on, on our wiki how to access uh, CDMFS. So I, I will go on. Oh, sorry, how do I move that? I will demo. Uh, uh, so we have a, a cloud, uh, uh, an OpenStack uh, cluster. So I will launch a brand new VM and I want to show how, how quickly uh, it, it can be done. Uh, so I will launch a CentOS 7 VM. Uh, let's use a couple of cores and memory, and uh, I think that's it. I will give it a floating IP. So this will take uh, one or two minutes to build the instance. Uh, so while this build, so on, on our wiki, we have the instructions to access our CVMFS uh, uh, stack. Uh, so if you want to use this, either on a personal computer or on, or on a cloud, uh, we ask that you subscribe to an announcement list so that 
even if we try, so we strive not to make breaking changes, but if sometimes in the future it's needed, uh, we will announce it on that, that list. Uh, so we, we ask that, that you do that. The requirements that we have, uh, it, it needs to be a supported operating system that's basically any Linux uh, with kernel 2632 on your. Um, we are uh, going to uh, increase that, uh, that kernel uh, requirement to 3.x in, in the future uh, for part of the stack. So the old stack will still keep working, uh, but we will have a new one that, that will uh, uh, take benefit of features in kernel, uh, kernel 3.x. Um, it could be Windows, as I, uh, as I said, with uh, um, Windows uh, subsystem for, for Linux. It requires the version 2, which back in the summer, it was uh, only available to uh, Microsoft developers uh, program. Uh, but right now, it, maybe it's public, publicly available. Uh, there are op uh, optimal requirements. So if, if you want to integrate with the scheduler, we support uh, Slurm or Tor or PBS. Uh, we have uh, our open API is built for InfiniBand, Omnipath, uh, or, or Ethernet. Uh, so it, it's detected at runtime, basically. Um, and the installation instructions, we have them for CentOS, Fedora, Debian, and Ubuntu. Uh, uh, not sure what SLE stands for, OpenSUSE or, or Windows. Uh, and it's really a, just a couple of commands. So now my my instance is running. I will uh, connect to the instance. So my keys are already in there. So it's really there's not even VI installed. It's it's really a bare. Um, Really a bare CentOS uh, 76 uh, uh, VM. I don't have the module command. I don't have uh, anything installed. So following the instructions here, the first thing is to install. Uh, so CERN provides a yum repository. So it's to install that that uh, repository in the VM. This takes longer than usual. <laughs> of course, it's Murphy's law. Um, the well, while this is running, the second so we also have a yum repository on which we distribute the configuration uh, for uh, the CDM or our, our CDMFS uh, configuration. Uh, so I will install that here, and then it's actually installing the CDMFS client. Um, and, and the, the configuration. So the first two were installing the repositories so that CentOS is aware of them. Uh, now I'm actually installing CVMFS and the dependencies. So it runs through views, it uses Perl uh, a little bit. I'm not sure why it uses Perl, it, why it might be a, just a dependency of something else. So it installed uh, 25 megs or so of, uh, of software, so it, it's actually pretty small. Uh, and I will, use, I will need to install VI because I, I cannot work without VI. <laughs> Okay, uh, and after that, you have one configuration file to create uh, CVMF, ATC CVMFS default local. And uh, we give the configuration here. And this can change depending on, on, your, uh, on your cluster. So, for example, uh, CVMFS quota limit, this is the amount of space that you want to give CVMFS for your local cache. Uh, and that amount needs to be smaller than the, the size of your disk. Uh, so for the VM, I will need to change that. 
the CVMFS HTTP proxy. Well, this would be if you are in a cluster, you have squids, you would define those uh, over there. Uh, so in my case, in a VM, I don't need to use uh, a proxy. Well, we'll just change this to uh, six gigabytes here. I can specify, I connect directly uh, to the strata one, which is fine with the, for a VM, which uh, you should not do for a cluster uh, because you really want to pass with proxies. And now that this is done, I can just check the setup, make sure there's no mistake. So that's okay. Uh, I can probe to see if it's able to mount the CVMFS uh, uh, stack. And this here, this line on our cluster, it's automatic, automatically done. Uh, if you if you mount yours either you can tell users you re, you need to run that or you could wrap that in a module or you could uh, <coughs> automatically uh, in my case I, I need to do it manually and uh, now I have modules available. Uh, it might take a couple of seconds the first time because it, it is fetching the, the module files, uh, but after that it will be just as if it's uh, on a local uh, cluster. So if I want uh, to load the uh, Python, so if I check which Python right now is the default uh, that is in the Nix profile, I can load Python 3.7. And now I have uh, Python 3.7. So it really is that simple. Um, X11 works. Uh, so I'm running out of time, so I won't do it. But I could load Paraview and, and uh, start X11 uh, Paraview through X11 forwarding on my VM. That, that, that just works. Um, so back to the slide. Um, so what now is, is it actually used? Well, so it, we know it's used on our national systems since, since the deployment uh, in, in 2017, uh, but it's now been adopted by legacy systems. Uh, so what, some of those 30 something systems are no longer part of Compute Canada. They are still owned by the institution and run lo locally. And instead of installing their own software, they just use the one that we provide. It's also being used for new local systems from member institutions that are not Compute Canada, that they are really local systems and they also use this. And we even have end users that started using this for continuous integration development in VMs. So they want to build their software against our software stack and then be just be able to just copy the executable and make sure that it works. We also have uh, another project called Magic Castle uh, which uh, allows you to recreate a Compute Canada cluster in any cloud, whether our OpenStack or Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure. Uh, it, it, it recreates a cluster in a matter of minutes. And if you are going to uh, fuzz them, there will be a session given by my colleague, Philip San Juan, uh, who is the, the developer of that. That's why I highly uh, recommend you, you attend that, that session. Uh, for future work, we are working uh, in, uh, in 2020 to get rid of Nix and use Gen2 prefix instead as a compatibility layer. Uh, that's for reasons uh, like the, the hash that, that causes problems, so we want to get rid of that part. Um, the, the 2016 or 2018 stack that, that uh, we have provided will keep working with Nix, uh, but the, the future work will, will get rid of, of that. Uh, we will require for that version, uh, version uh, kernel 3.x, uh, mostly for because it provides some uh, optimizations. Uh, we are looking possibly at fat binaries to, to handle uh, the CPR architecture, which we don't do right now. Uh, also looking at distributing uh, data sets, uh, container images, uh, and since it's starting to be used outside of Compute Canada, we have in, over the years, we have made some assumptions about uh, the layout of the system, and those might not be true on other systems, or we are looking at uh, offering better customization for, for those. 
Uh, we're also looking to integrate different tools. Uh, Reframe is one of them, and I think there's a presentation on Reframe tomorrow. Uh, so we've started working on that. Exalt as well to do better tracking of the software and utilization. And uh, an another which um, I'm not sure if we'll get to or not, but uh, me, uh, which is a, a pretty neat system to uh, to discover software that are installed um, uh, um, to basically uh, the user will type for example Chromax and uh, the system will <coughs> say well I don't know Chromax but you might be able to uh, load this module get uh, so that's a pretty pretty idea that uh, we might look to integrate uh, so this is uh, before 2015. Uh, as I said, was not automated, and right now uh, the where we are at. So we can do mass recompilation. We can work on more interesting projects like uh, doing uh, uh, regression testing with Reframe or integrating new tools, which is more interesting than reinstalling yet again that software for another system. So it, it's really uh, improved on our our distribution. And on our work. And on that, I uh, thank you, and I'm open uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Maxime. Any questions for Maxime? So, thank you for the nice talk. Um, what with software installations with EasyBuild that require Python packages? Are they also uh, pulled from this wheelhouse? And what with packages that are not yet in the wheelhouse? Will they automatically be installed there? Or how do you handle that? Uh, so for so the second part of the question, the if a user tries to install a Python package with pip and we don't have it in the wheelhouse, if there is access to internet, it, it will fetch it from PyPy. Uh, so that works fine for actually many Python packages that are just pure Python. You don't really need to do, to do anything. Um, if it's not like TensorFlow or things that are binary uh, packages, uh, we will get a user request and we will create a wheel. Um, creating a wheel is, uh, in the vast majority of cases, rather trivial to do. Uh, and we, we, we actually have a wheel builder script for, for that, but it basically amounts to pip wheel, the name of the package in 95% of the cases. Sometimes you have to uh, give it more instructions about where, where your libraries are. Um, for packages that depend on Python and are installed uh, via easy build, uh, we, will, we will install those dependencies as part of the package. Uh, of the module, basically. Um, we also tend, so for example, if, uh, if you load the OpenCV module, we have installed the Python findings as part of the OpenCV module. So we don't create a second uh, independent module for uh, OpenCV Python. You just load OpenCV, you get uh, the, the Python bindings. Same thing for Qt. Uh, you get PyQt in installed as part of the Qt module. And uh, we, we do it in a way that it supports basically every version of Python. Uh, so with the multi-dep uh, feature that was introduced in, in Easy Build uh, re recently. OK, and the wheelhouse, do you have multiple wheelhouses for each architecture so that it's optimized? Uh, yes, so we do. If, uh, if I go back here, um, I don't know if. Maybe it's better than that way. Um, in uh, so in our wheelhouse, we have one which is generic, which contains uh, actually quite a lot of things, uh, all of the pure Python packages, but we have some for example for AVX 512 which will contain the version of the package uh, specifically compiled for that CPU architecture. 
and um, when when we run pip install, it will first look into the best architecture and then fall back on generate if it's not found. Okay, thanks. Um, are all compute clusters um, in, in Canada like um, are all the compute clusters homogeneous in regards to the CPU architecture? Uh, I'm actually referring if you have a mix of different CPU architectures and you build the software and the user's job is scheduled on one of the nodes, is there actually a way to load the right? Yeah, we actually we actually have uh, one cluster that is hybrid has uh, has well and Skylake nodes. Uh, by default, users will have will, will use the the Haswell stack because it works everywhere. Uh, but we provide um, uh, some modules to switch architecture, so the the Arc uh, modules. And here, uh, it automatically detected actually that the VM I'm running on uh, <coughs> Arc is AVX2 capable, so it will show only the architecture that, that work on that. Uh, so if a user runs, asks specifically for a Skylake, they can load the AVX512 stack and then use that. And then also the user's job will land only on the AVX uh, capable nodes? Uh, no, the, the user needs to both request a Skylake node specifically and then load the the, the AVX512 uh, okay. uh, stack, the, the AVX512 branch of the module. The FAT binaries would, would be a, a nice way to handle that. Uh, the reason we haven't done it in the past is that it's really only supported by Intel. Uh, I think GCC has done some work to do that, but uh, it's it's still not uh, not great. And we didn't want to have a different solution for Intel than GCC, but we we might be looking into that in the future. Any other questions? Maybe one final one. Okay, no. Thank you very much, Maxime. If, uh, if you have questions in the future, I'm on Slack, Bart is on Slack, you can contact us. Uh, on, on our wiki, there's also a link to the paper that was submitted at PERC, so if you want to have more technical details, you, you can go there. Thanks for having okay. me. Thank you very Thanks much. So much.